Hi everybody and welcome back to Miss Angler's biology class. I am Miss Angler. Today we are doing the life sciences paper two exam prediction for the November 2023 exam. Now if you haven't gone and watched paper one then I've linked it up above now for you to go and watch it and then come back to this video so we can get into all the questions and topics I think they're going to ask this year. Now, I want you to know that I haven't seen the final paper, so I don't know exactly what's going to be in there, but I have a pretty good understanding of how the examiner thinks and what they like to ask. And so I'm drawing on my knowledge as a final matric marker, as well as a grade 12 teacher. And so I have a good understanding with all my years of experience of what they want you to say and what they're looking for in the questions and the style of questions they're going to ask. Now, I don't want you to use this video as a, a way to eliminate things that you're not going to study. You are using this video to determine if you are ready for your final. Can you do all these sections and all these questions that I'm going to insert throughout this video? And if you can, then you are ready for your final. Then you know you're good to go. Now, something else that's really exciting that I've worked really hard on is the Smart Start series. It is a video workshop that I have created, which feels like you're being tuned by me. I cover every single topic in paper one and in paper two. There are over five hours of content together and included in that you will get a set of questions that you must attempt as you progress through the video to see whether you are ready for your final and it will indicate am I going to get 50% for this or am I going to get 80% for this final exam. Now if you want to get your hands on the Smart Start series then you can find it on missangler.co.za under the tab that says Smart Start Series. I have so many other resources as well as my cheat sheet, which does have a discount code. It is going to be finals 2023. So go and check that out. You can also get access to my flashcards and there is a whole free bundle of flashcards. Or if you'd like, you can also purchase the entire set of over 500 flashcards. So let's begin with the multiple choice questions. Now this section we should be aiming to get full marks for and it's a good indicator if you're going to progress into the harder questions if you're ready. Now I see a lot more genetic questions coming up this year. So what should we expect? We should expect to see things like, what is the difference between a gene and an allele? Do we know those differences? Um, genetic engineering, GMOs, we need to know our laws, so be able to identify the law of dominance, um, the law of segregation, that kind of thing. But I also think that they may give you like sets of alleles and you have to determine which uh, group of alleles is the correct choice. This links into my next thing that I think is going to come up, which is meiosis. Now, meiosis is going to present itself as potentially identifying different phases or identifying the processes like crossing over random arrangement that occur to increase genetic variation. Last but not least in the multiple choice question is going to be an evolution question, but it's probably going to be an application question. And that is how the order of multiple choice generally goes. We go from easier to harder and we're going to end with a harder evolution application question. So how are they going to ask this application question at the end? I see it happening in sort of two ways. One, it's going to be more evolution based. So they'll give you like a table, for example, um, of organisms that share certain percentages of DNA or genetics or genes and they'll say like who is more closely related based off the evidence in the table they might give you a phylogenetic tree as well and that means that this evolution question can also overlap with DNA and genetics so that's also why these questions are more challenging because they are multidisciplined. in other words you have to know enough about each of these topics genetics DNA and evolution in order to answer it. And it has been a trend in all the papers over at least the last four years, where the last question really requires some deeper thinking into the overlap between genetics and evolution. Now let's move into the terminology section. Now the terminology section is a good indicator, as I always say, as to whether or not you're ready to go into the longer questions because if you can't use the words properly or identify them you won't be able to use them in like a longer explanation right so a word i think they're going to ask or one of these two words because we get them confused with each other all the time is 
discontinuous variation and continuous variation. We often don't know the difference between these two things and they love to ask it in terminology. Another one which is always a firm favorite of examiners is going to be um, the different kinds of bonds. Is it a peptide bond or is it a hydrogen bond? They love that. They also love the differences between biotechnology and genetic engineering. These are firm favorites of examiners because we often confuse these terms with one another, which also lends itself to having these words appear in the A, B, both or none section. I'm also seeing in the terminology section a lot of RNA term words. So think about all the words that are associated with RNA. For example, uracil, uh, ribonucleic acid, so that's the full name of RNA. Um, think about the tRNA, so transfer RNA, uh, messenger RNA, um, amino acids. Think about the words that are all associated around RNA, and I think those are going to be quite prevalent in this exam terminology section. Now we're going to move into the A, B, both or none section. And remember, these questions are there to actually confuse you. You really have to be solid in your knowledge to get six out of six here, because what they do is they put terms that are very similar to one another, starting off with meiosis and the phases of meiosis. They'll give you a statement about meiosis and is it anaphase one or anaphase two? They do this on purpose because they want to see, do you really know your phases? The second thing I think that's going to pop up in our A, B, both or none section is going to be a question around the theories we've studied. And they'll give a, a short sentence about the theory and it will be something like, was this Darwin or was this Lamarck? Was this Mendel or was this Darwin? Was this Gould or was this Eldridge? And those are all the people that we've learned this year and their theories and how they've influenced evolution and genetics. And we often mistake them. So I think you need to pay them a little bit more attention when you study now. The third and final thing that I do think is going to come up in the A, B, both or none section is going to be fossils, specifically human fossils. And they are probably going to ask you um, who discovered this fossil. They'll give you an example of the fossil or the fossil's name, and they'll say, um, was it broom? Was it um, dart? Was it um, the leakies? Who was it? If it's not the scientist who discovered it, because that's also what we confuse, they might also ask you uh, an example. So they'll give the name of the species like Australopithecus and then they'll say is it Mrs. Plez or is it Taong Child, is it both, is it none, so make sure you know your fossil names, who discovered them and where they discovered them, Kenya, Ethiopia, South Africa, very well. Now let's begin with question one. Question one is still part of the beginning section of your exam where the first 50 marks are. And these are all the like label, identify um, questions. They, they should be quite quick to do. I think we're going to start off with a meiosis question. I think this year they're going to focus a lot of attention on crossing over, which means you might have to draw a cell with a um, set of chromosomes crossing over. You might have to answer some questions about whether crossing over leads to genetic variation, identify the structures, and you really need to be confident in this exam to draw a phase or to draw the product of a phase. In other words, they really like this new way of asking what would the chromosomes look like at the end of this phase of meiosis and make sure if they have crossed over that you've correctly shaded in the parts that have been exchanged and label those parts. That's also very important and give a heading for that drawing. The next thing that we always see in question one is going to be a dihybrid cross. Now, remember, everybody, you do not need to do a full dihybrid cross of 16 outcomes. They will give you a portion of it, either in a table, and you'll have to fill in the missing blanks, or they're going to ask you to sort of work backwards. They'll say, these are the children. What were the parents' gametes um, or the parents' genotypes? So you'll have to sort of work backwards based off of what the children were. The final thing that they might ask you is something like, what genes or what is the genotype of the offspring that is not like their parents? An example would be if both parents are tall and green, the opposite of them would be like short and purple. 
How do we get that combination looking at the alleles that are present? The next question that I see popping up in question one is going to be a very basic DNA structure question. It might be a whole molecule of DNA um, or it might be just like the one side of it potentially or like an RNA strand if it is one strand on its own but they're definitely going to be asking you things like what is the name of this nucleotide what is its complementary base pair what is the name of the bond you know things like that where do you find it in the cell you know nucleus um do you find it in a chloroplast a mitochondria those kinds of things short sweet little answers that will get you 50 out of 50. Now let's get into the first set of questions that are going to pop up in question two and three and for me that is going to be a DNA uh, protein synthesis question, right? Um, I think this year we're going to focus more in on translation and then a nice follow-up to that is a mutation that occurs during translation. Um, I think they do that in two ways. The first part of the question will have like a step in translation for you to identify, maybe give some labels, tell us what's going on. Remember to use your exam guideline to give us the proper bullet pointed answer that has all of the points in it. So you get full marks. Um, and then I think below that, they love to then lead into some kind of mutation question. Um, they'll give you like an amino acid table and how it's changed. What was it before? What is it now? How has that changed the amino acid? You've got to have your wits about you for that kind of question, because if there's no changes, um, or should I say, let me rephrase that, there are changes in the nucleotides, but if you read the amino acid table carefully, sometimes the different um, nucleotides can code for the same amino acid. Now, linked with this question um, is going to be DNA replication. I don't think DNA replication gets enough attention when we study for it. Um, potentially, this might be the longer question where you might have to explain DNA replication in full. So please make sure that you know that and how to differentiate between um, replication and transcription. And one of the main steps that is different is in DNA replication, you are using both strands as templates, whereas in transcription, you're just using one strand as a template. The next question I see coming up is going to be some kind of genetic cross. Now, new examiners are really liking using genetic crosses for other kinds of dominance. So think incomplete dominance or co-dominance questions. And they really like this, guys. Um, and it's quite simple to identify whether or not they're going with that due to the outcome of the offspring. The offspring are the clue, right? So if you are dealing with a co-dominant group, you will have, let's say, one color, a contrasting color, and then you will have a co-dominant group, which will mean that if it was black and white, they would be white with black spots, right? That's co-dominant. If it's incomplete dominance, we could use the same example. We'd have a white and a black, let's say mouse, and then their offspring are gray, which is a mix, right? It's like an intermediate color. Next up in question two and three is some kind of karyotype. Um, I sort of went back and forward on this one because I wasn't sure if it was going to be a karyotype this year or was it going to be a um, genetic or sorry, a DNA profile, you know, with the bars to see is it the is it the paternity test or is it the dad or is it a, a murder investigation? But I think they haven't done a karyotype in a while. And remember, whenever they do karyotypes, they really like to center their questions also around disorders, maybe something like Down syndrome. So just make sure you're able to read karyotypes. And also, by the way, determine if they are male or female from their karyotype. Now, the next thing we must always expect in a paper two is a pedigree diagram. Um, I think last year or potentially even this year's rewrite had the pedigree diagram all the way, I think in question one, which is quite surprising, but we must always expect a pedigree diagram somewhere in the exam because that is how they're testing our knowledge to see whether or not we understand how alleles and disorders are inherited. This year, I think they're going to do a pedigree diagram on a sex-linked disorder. Um, I think they might ask maybe something on like red-green color blindness, maybe. They did hemophilia last year, and I think they did it in the rewrite. So I feel like that's 
it's too repetitive to do it so close together. They might give you a new sex link disorder. Remember, they are allowed to do that. They don't have to give you one that is in the guideline. They can give you a different one. Next up under the genetic section is going to be something around genetically modified organisms, GMOs, or like artificial selection. I think this might be an investigation question. Um, it either might present itself as a paragraph that you must read and then answer questions based off that paragraph, or a, a, a true, true, true investigative question where they give you a breakdown of like all the steps they did and you have to identify the variables. Is it reliable? Is it valid? What is the conclusion? Maybe even draw a graph. Um, remember, in every exam, you are either going to draw a image, so a diagram or a graph. So depending on what happens in paper one, will give you a good clue as to what you might be expected to do in paper two. And remember, I mentioned it in paper one, there is always the dreaded pie chart that can also come up. So just keep that in mind when you're preparing this section. Still under the umbrella of genetics is a cloning question. Now, this is a question they like because it's application. Um, they have asked stem cells last year, and then I think they asked reproductive cloning in the rewrite. So for me, the signs are saying molecular cloning. Um, molecular cloning, if you have forgotten, is when organisms um, are taken like bacteria, uh, we take their plasmid, we cut out a piece of DNA and we insert our DNA so that it can produce substances for us like insulin. I think that might be the vibe they're going for. Generally, they give you a picture to help you out, but you do need to know the intricacies of how it all works. And there might be this kind of overlap in a previous question when I mentioned like artificial selection and genetics earlier on. My Final uh, suggestion for genetics in question two and three has to be around blood groups. Um, blood groups are asked because they are an example of co-dominance and complete dominance at the same time. So they do present uh, a harder question. I think maybe they might ask you something around paternity and blood groups. Remember, blood groups cannot determine if a father is a father. They can just exclude fathers because remember, people can have the same blood group, but they don't have to be related to one another. And so that means maybe you also might need to determine the father is the father based off of a DNA profile and his blood group. And maybe even do a genetic cross to do that. They might ask you to say, like, using the alleles of the parents, um, you create a genetic cross to show that they are, aren't possibly the father, or this man can't possibly be the father, something like that. Now let's get into the evolution questions. And I think we're going to start off with a natural selection question. I say this because previously the natural selection questions haven't been very application based. Uh, they were just like explain basic straightforward. I think this year they are going to ask you an application question on evolution. So maybe there might be an explanation on evolution today. Um, they are really loving how uh, antibiotic resistance, uh, ARV resistance, um, pesticide resistance, all those ones. I think you should go over those because they can ask also an investigation question here too. Um, you have to identify the variables. Maybe they give you a table of results. Um, and then they ask you to use natural selection to explain how, let's take the pesticide one, for example, how these organisms um, have been selected for so that they become resistant to the pesticide and how the others have died off, you know, something like that. So I think you need to prepare those well-worded seven to eight mark questions. The next thing that I see coming up in the evolution section has to be a human evolution question. Um, and they've been using lots of different parts of the skeleton recently. Um, it's always safe to say that there will be a question on some part of the skeleton. And I think that uh, a focus might be on the shape of the um, vertebral column this year. Um, so they might ask you, like, how does the shape of the vertebral column support bipedalism? Um, you know, the S shape. Um, they may even lead it into the foot as well. So they talk about the toes. They talk about the heel bone. And last but not least, we can never overlook the pelvis, the shape of the pelvis and how that supports bipedalism. Um, 
And of course, the foramen magnum at the base of the cranium also supports bipedalism. So as you can see, I've mentioned all the major structures, but I've mentioned how they all link into bipedalism. Now let's go into what I see as the final two questions in this paper, and that is going to be in the speciation section of evolution. I think it's going to be an application question of speciation. So sort of like, you know, that whole basic one island becomes two um, and then those two populations, the individuals, keyword individuals, undergo um, natural selection independently, um, blah, blah, blah. They're separated by geographical barrier. That's where biogeography comes in. And you're going to have to like connect those two ideas together, speciation and biogeography. Um, I also want to remind you that there seems to be a new examiner on the scene who is loving these table questions. Um, and I have inserted the two variations. The first one is from the 2022 paper, and the second one is from the 2023 rewrite paper. So I'm not saying you'll see one exactly like this. What I'm saying is be prepared to do something similar to what these questions are asking you. And maybe you'll get another table this year. Who knows? Well, last but not least, I think we don't study this section well enough, and that is the out of Africa hypothesis. This can also link into the biogeography that I just mentioned now, and they can ask you about how the human species has originated, where did it originate, what are the examples of the fossils, um, and you need to be on point, and you should be using your exam guideline for this. Now, as always, if you like this video, don't forget to go give it a thumbs up and make sure you are subscribed with your notifications on because I post every Tuesday and Thursday and I want to say good luck to you metrics. I have also included some more questions at the end of this video and um, as a little bonus to see can you do these questions and if you can I think you're really ready to write your final exams and I will see you all again soon. Bye!